Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Kari Slettnes. I am leader of the subject Expil at IFIC, Department of Philosophy, Classics, History of Arts and Adis here at the University of Oslo. On behalf of uh, the staff of philosophers, I am honored and very glad to wish you all welcome to this year's great Expil lecture, 2022. Expil trains students in philosophy and structured thinking. The purpose of Expil is to develop students' ability to relate reflectively uh, to the knowledge uh, and the sciences today. Expil aims, amongst other things, to instill uh, in our students the ability to reflect on ethical issues as they arise and to question truth in both knowing, being, and doing, epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. Since 2017, our institute has organized the annual Great Expel Lecture to give students an insight into the important area of current philosophical research. This year's Expel Lecture is the fifth Great Expel Lecture so far in this short but proud tradition. Earlier um, years, Expel lecturers have been Peter Singer on animal ethics, Sally Haslanger on ideology and power, Åsa Wikbos on knowledge resistance, and last year in 2021, Stephen Gardner was invited to lecture on climate crisis and institutional denialism. Today's lecture is held by one of our most distinguished philosophers at our, in our time, Kasim Kassam from University of Warwick, and it is entitled Extremism. Kasim Kassam is a professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick. He is an honorary fellow of Keeble College, Oxford, and, and a fellow of the British Academy. His research includes writing on reductionism in Kant, ways of knowing and basis of self-knowledge, epistemic vices, self-knowledge, and in the later years, he has written philosophically analysis on, amongst other subjects, conspiracy theories from 2019, Vices of the Mind from the Intellectual to the Political, Oxford 2019, and Extremism, a Philosophical Analysis, Routledge 2022. The question today is, what is extremism? What are we talking about when we talk about extremism? Or describe certain individuals or groups as extremists. After Kassam's lecture, we will have a 15 minutes break. Then we will have comments on the topic of Kassam's lecture um, and ex extremism from philosophers Sebastian Watzel and then social anthropologist um, Katrina Tuletson. After the lecture and the comments from the invited panel, uh, they will be open for questions from the audience. But now, first of all, a very warm welcome to Professor Kasim Kassam. <laughs> okay, so thank you for those kind words and thank all of you for showing up for this event. So a couple of years ago, maybe you remember this, but a couple of years ago, the, the Guardian newspaper in the UK published a report saying that Extinction Rebellion had been classified as an extremist organization, an organization with an extremist ideology. Um, naturally, XR were not very pleased with this and responded vigorously to that accusation. Okay, now, in case you don't know, uh, Extinction Rebellion is, a, is an activist organization that um, campaigns for action to deal with climate change. And the key 
point to notice is that they say that they're non-violent, although they support various kinds of direct action and civil disobedience. So a question that you might ask, certainly it's a question that I asked, was, well, was the description of XR as an extremist organization, was that a justified description, or was that just an attempt by the authorities to delegitimize a perfectly legitimate uh, form of radical protest? Now, to answer that question, of course, we need to know what we're talking about when we talk about extremism. So that brings me to the subject of today's uh, lecture. So here are the questions that I'm going to be addressing. So the first one, the obvious one, what is extremism? What are we talking about when we talk about extremism? The second question, which is uh, raised really by the XR case, which is when the, the label extremism is used, is it really a label for a genuine phenomenon? Or is it simply a term of abuse that's used by the, roughly speaking, the authorities to, to delegitimize de protest? Okay, that's the second question. The third question, in a way, the most interesting question is, is extremism, assuming that there is such a thing, is it in any case a bad thing? I and mean, what's wrong with extremism? So here are, here are a couple of choice quotations. I don't know if you've read the Philip Roth novel, American Pastoral. Uh, if you haven't read it, read it. It's terrific. Uh, so one of the characters in American Pastoral is a young woman called Mary. Uh, and Mary becomes uh, politically active in her late teens. Uh, particularly uh, in relation to America's war in Vietnam. And at some point she in, uh, engages in a terrorist act that results in someone dying. And she has this dialogue with her father uh, who, who can't understand it, who can't understand Mary. Like, why, why are you doing this stuff? Okay, and, and, and Mary has a whole complicated justification for, for why she does what she does. But essentially her argument is that um, these were extreme circumstances, you know, where you had uh, the carpet bombing of Vietnam by American planes, something had to be done. Right? So Mary's way of putting it was to say, sometimes you have to fucking go to the extreme. Okay, well, isn't that true? Someone from a very different political angle said something quite similar, Barry Goldwater, right? So I'd be willing to guess that most of you don't know who Barry Goldwater was. Right? So Goldwater was a right-wing Republican uh, and a candidate for the American presidential election in 1964. Uh, but Goldwater uh, said this, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice and moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. So, again, sort of making the case for a kind of extremism. Uh, and Martin Luther King Jr. says something uh, similar to that, which I'll come to. Okay, so those are my three questions. So I want to now uh, get on to the first question. So here's the kind of basic idea um, of, of, of this talk. So what I want to say is that when we talk about extremism, we're really talking about three different things. They're related things, but they're different. So one form of extremism is what I call methods extremism. Okay, so to be an extremist in this sense is simply to use extreme methods in pursuit of one's objectives. So if you think about ISIS, ISIS beheadings, okay, so, so I mean, these are not just random acts of cruelty. I mean, this is strategic barbarism right, on the part of ISIS. They, they do it or did it uh, in pursuit of their political objectives, right? but it was an, it was it was an extreme method of achieving uh, one's political objectives. Okay, so that's one form of extremism. It's methods extremism. Now, of course, you're then going to say, well, what do you mean by an extreme method? Okay, and I'm going to come back to that because that's obviously a fundamental question. Uh, second type of extremism, perhaps the one that's most familiar, is ideological extremism. Right? So, to be an extremist in that sense is to subscribe to, to endorse an extremist ideology. And the third variety of extremism is uh, what I call psychological extremism. So to be an extremist in the psychological sense is to have an extremist mindset. 
Okay, so the, 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 the task, I think, is to understand what these three forms of extremism are and how they relate to one another. So let's start off with the question of methods, extreme methods. Now, very often today, I think, when people think about extreme methods, they assume that extreme methods are violent methods. Right? So anyone who uses violence in pursuit of their objectives is thereby a methods extremist. Now that's false, it seems to me. Okay, so here's, here are two reasons why I think that's false. So first of all, there are extreme methods that do not involve violence. So a classic case of this is in, uh, in Northern Ireland in the early 1980s. Members of the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, were imprisoned by the British authorities uh, and they were campaigning for recognition as political prisoners. And as part of their campaign, 10 IRA prisoners launched a hunger strike. Well, more than 10 launched a hunger strike, but 10 of them actually died. Okay, so the most famous one was a young man called Bobby Sands. Uh, who starved himself to death. He didn't take any food for 66 days uh, and died. Okay, now if you say, well, why do you want to say that's an extreme method? Well, it's an extreme method in the sense that it's something that very few of us could do, uh, and it involves uh, uh, prolonged uh, and severe suffering. Okay, so that would be an example of a nonviolent extreme method. Now, of course, if you want to be really clever about this, you can then get into a discussion of how you define violence. Uh, okay, and, and if someone wants to raise that question, we can discuss it. On the other side, I think there are circumstances, I want to say that there are circumstances um, in which um, it's possible to use uh, violence without thereby counting as an extremist. So the example I, I, I like here is the ANC. So the African National Congress right, was a liberation movement in South Africa which was involved in an armed struggle against apartheid. Now, the ANC certainly did use violence. It wasn't predominantly reliant on violence, but it did use violence in pursuit of its political objective. And its political objective was, of course, the ending of apartheid, right, a system of racial discrimination, and its replacement by democracy. Uh, now, I would want to argue that the use of violence by the ANC, its, its armed struggle, did not make it an extremist organization in the method sense. And, and one reason for that is the reason that Nelson Mandela gave. Uh, Mandela's argument was, look, we tried nonviolence. Right? Nonviolence proved completely ineffective against apartheid. So the only choice for the ANC was either to just live with apartheid, right, to live with uh, systematic racial discrimination and marginalization, or to engage in an armed struggle. So I want to suggest that, that in, in, in that case, in those circumstances, the use of violence in pursuit of one's political objectives does not make one an extremist not even a methods extremist. So the implication of what I'm saying then about methods extremism is, I mean, it's fairly obvious, which is that um, whether the use of violence makes you an extremist depends upon context. It's not an absolute question. There isn't a simple yes or no answer to the question, does the use of violence in pursuit of your objectives make you an extremist? It depends. Okay, so, so, so the, the context of Apartheid era South Africa was a context, I would want to argue, in which the use of uh, violence um, did not amount to a form of extremism. Now, if you then say, well, okay, so what exactly are these contextual factors that are relevant to deciding whether to classify uh, violence as extreme? In fact, it's a very, it's a very kind of complicated question. So, so here's, uh, here are some of the considerations. So one question that I think we tend to ask when we address this issue is, well, was violence being employed in a just cause? Now, you might say, oh, but isn't it all, I mean, doesn't that make the notion of extremism uh, completely evaluative? 
It, it's a val it, you know, it, it, it depends on your values. It depends on your conception of what a just cause is. And I think that's right. I think that it actually isn't a way of talking about extremism um, that is completely neutral. So if you think if you think about you know Ukrainian you know Ukrainians today using violence to resist the Russian uh, uh, occupation of their country, I'm not myself inclined to call that extremism. Right? They're, they're doing the only thing that they can do in a just cause, the cause of getting the Russians out of Ukraine. Right? So that's one question. Of course, there are questions about the nature of the violence that's employed. Um, another question is, was the violence uh, actually an effective way of achieving the objectives for which it was intended? I mean, there's no point using violence if violence isn't going to get you what you are after. Then there's the Mandela point right, about the necessity of violence. Right, so, so, so violence, I think, becomes a kind of extremism when it is used when, when there's an alternative to it. Right. So that's the question, was violence necessary? And if it was necessary, why was it necessary? Right. Sometimes people, re organizations resort to violence and they say we had no choice, but the reason they had no choice is that no one supports them. Okay, so, so it, it's not even enough to say that violence was necessary. It de a lot depends on why it was necessary. If the fact that you had no choice is a reflection of the fact that nobody supports you, then that makes your use of violence uh, extremist. Of course, then there's the question of proportionality. Was the violence proportional? Uh, was it likely to be effective? Were its targets legitimate? And of course, you then have to have a discussion about what counts as a legitimate target. Okay, so right now in Ukraine, I'd want to argue that uh, Russian military personnel on Ukrainian territory are legitimate targets right, for um, um, Ukrainian resistance. Right? Um, civilians, no. Uh, and then there's the question of whether violence was a last resort. And the way, and certainly if you look at Man Mandela's arguments, I mean, Mandela argued that in South Africa, violence was a last resort. Of course, everyone says that they use violence as a last resort. But of course, the question is, is it actually true? Right. So someone who, someone who wants to defend violence on the grounds that, you know, they've tried everything else. Well, we need to ask the question, did they try everything else? Is that actually right? Okay, so these are some of the contextual factors, I think, that um, are relevant to classifying violence as extremism. Okay, so, so there are cases, there are contexts in which um, using violence in pursuit of your objectives does not make you an extremist. Okay, so um, I, I think we now have the picture of the uh, a picture of the archetypal methods extremist. Okay, so I want to say that the archetypal methods extremist is someone who uses unnecessary and or disproportionate violence, not as a last resort, in pursuit of an unjust but hopeless cause and against illegitimate targets. Okay, so Mr. Breivik, you all know of, so he would be a violent methods extremist according to that definition, right? He meets all of those conditions. Okay. Another interesting case, a more complicated case, I think is uh, Al-Qaeda and particularly uh, Osama bin Laden, who the Americans refer to as UBL. Okay, so here's bin Laden's justification of Al-Qaeda terrorism. As they kill us, they being the Americans, without a doubt, we have to kill them until we obtain a balance in terror. Civilians, bin Laden argued, are legitimate targets. They are not exonerated from responsibility for the actions of their government. Right, so we kill American civilians. That is valid both religiously and logically. That last statement strikes me as absurd. Right? Uh, it's, neither, it's neither valid re religious, religiously nor logically, but that's an attempt by someone to, to make the case for methods extremism, a failed attempt to make the case 
for methods extremism. So um, that's as much as I want to say about methods extremism. Now to move on to ideological extremism. Now I want to say a little bit about this, but not too much. Um, so the basic idea is this. Supposing you think of ideologies as um, located in what you might think of as ideological space. Now that sounds very abstract, but you're all familiar with the distinction between left-wing and right-wing ideologies. Okay, so the left to right dimension is one dimension of ideological space. Okay, so an extremist ideology on this view is simply an ideology that falls somewhere near the end of, of that dimension, either on the far right or the far left. However, and this is a, a kind of key point, ideological space has more than one dimension. Right? You can classify ideologies on the left to right dimension, but there are lots of other dimensions on which you can classify ideologies. Right? So there are ideologies that vary according to how authoritarian they are. Right? So if you look at you know, the, the old classics, fascism and communism, um, I mean, they are at opposite ends of the left-right spectrum, right? but you could argue that they're, the, they're at the same end of the authoritarianism spectrum. Okay, so, so there's, you know, there's also a, a pro-violence spectrum. You can classify ideologies according to their views about violence. Okay, so an extreme anti-violence political ideology was, the, was, of course, Mahatma Gandhi's ideology, which was, an ex as it were, an extreme anti-violence pacifist ideology. And if you're looking for a pro-violence ideology, well, I think far-right ideologies are pro-violence. I, I mean, fascist ideologies, neo-fascist ideologies, have an almost sort of slightly weird, slightly kind of kinky liking for violence. Um, okay, so that's another that's another spectrum. Okay, so, but but the basic idea then is that is that I, I, ideologies have locations along different spectra, uh, and an ideology can be ideologies can be at opposite ends of one spectrum, but at the same end of another spectrum. Now, if you then say, well, okay, but how do you decide where? along a given spectrum where a particular ideology goes. Right? So supposing, take the classic case, fa fascism. Should, that, should we say that's on the left? Should we say that it's on the right? Should we say it's in the middle? Okay, now just as a matter of historical fact, fascists themselves like to say that they're neither on the left nor on the right. right? They say that you know, fascism is a third way. So in deciding where and how to classify um, an ideology, uh, you have to look at a, a sort of, you have to ask a menu of diagnostic questions. Right? So you have to ask questions like, what's its view of violence? What's its view of the state? What's its view of democracy? Right? So, so, so that's how you, how you, how you uh, locate ideologies um, according to this view. And, and what, this, what this shows is that, is that um, Ideological extremism is relative in lots of different senses. It's relative to the dimension that you're talking about. It's also relative to the menu of questions that you use to locate an ideology along a given dimension. I mean, let me just give you an example. If you were in America today, right, and I was trying to work out where you stand on the left to right spectrum, I might actually be very interested in your views about gun control. And I might be very interested in your views about abortion. Because in the American context, these are fundamental issues that are used to classify people along the left to right dimension. If you were in the UK, and I, I, I take it if you were in Norway, those wouldn't be fundamental questions. You wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of figuring out what your politics are by asking your views about abortion, right? Because I, you know, there's far in Europe greater consensus about that than there is in the States. So there you have another kind of relativity. And of course, you also have historical relativity. Okay, so if you think about the cause of votes for women or anti-slavery, of course, these were at some point regarded as extreme causes, not any longer. Okay, so that's ideological, that's ideological extremism. It, can, it's a very, it, it turns out to be quite a sort of complicated, um, complicated subject, but maybe in the end, not that interesting. Um, 
And of course, this is a kind of obvious point to make, that of course there's a connection between ideological and methods extremism. Right? Some ideologies um, are much more interested in um, the use of extreme methods than others. It's also worth pointing out, it's also worth pointing out that the, the idea that, met, that, that violence is sometimes legitimate, that idea is not just confined to ideologies that are on the extreme left or the extreme right. Lots of ideologies actually are pro-violence in the sense that they think that violence is sometimes justified. I mean, here's an example. If you think about the American neocons, uh, the, Bush, the Bush administration, so what was George Bush's political objective in Iraq? Well, his political objective in Iraq was regime change. What was the means, what was the method that the United States used to achieve regime change? Well, of course, it was violence, right? It was, a, it was the invasion of Iraq. So that's a kind of classic example of an ideology that you might, well, maybe you don't agree with this, but you might not think of as an extremist ideology, nevertheless, endorsing violence in pursuit of his political objectives. Even President Obama right, certainly endorsed the use of violence in pursuit of the objective of defeating Al-Qaeda, the use of drone strikes. Right. Okay, so, so, the, so the connections between ideological and methods extremism are quite complicated. I mean, there are connections, but there, it isn't completely straightforward. Okay, so now I want to move on to uh, the last type of extremism, which is um, uh, psychological extremism. So let me start by introducing you to the notion of a mindset. So the cla a really classic discussion of this was in a book published in the 1950s by Eric Hoffer. And the book is called The True Believer. Now in this book, Hoffer talks about, he doesn't talk about extremists, he talks about fanatics, but I think the same point applies. So the thing that Hoffer says is that um, fanatics, whether of the extreme left or of the extreme right, fanatics are all very similar in a certain fundamental respect. Um, as he says, the fanatics of various hues eye each other with suspicion and are ready to fly at each other's throat, but they are neighbors and almost of one family. Right? So it doesn't matter what you're a fanatic about, just in virtue of the fact that you're a fanatic, you have in some sense so something in common right, with other fanatics for other causes. Okay, so this was Hoffa's idea. So uh, I think this isn't how Hoffa himself elaborates the notion. The way I would elaborate the notion is to say that um, uh, ideological extremists are very often of one family in the sense that they have a shared mindset, a common mindset. So what is this extremist mindset? Now, a mindset. Now, there are lots of different ways of understanding a mindset. So here's my own gloss on what a mindset is. So I want to say that one thing that uh, defines a person's mindset is their preoccupations. Now, now if you th just think about yourself right, or think about your friends. Right? I mean, I, I, all of you, I'm, I, I'm sure, are preoccupied with some things and completely indifferent to other things. Right? And your preoccupations may be just preoccupations or they might even be obsessions. So being preoccupied with something is part of the human condition. Okay, so I might be preoccupied with, you know, getting more stuff published, or you might be preoccupied with getting a job, or, right, we all have preoccupations. Extremists have a particular preoccupation, which I call the purity preoccupation. Extremists are preoccupied with religious purity, ethnic purity, racial purity, or ideological purity. And they are panicked by the thought that their purity is being diluted somehow. Okay, that's the purity preoccupation. Now, there are many, many examples of this. So if you think about uh, ISIS, so uh, here's, a, I think, a very good characterization of ISIS. So ISIS is preoccupied with purifying the Islamic lands of all alien and infidel influences. So this is a preoccupation with religious purity. 
uh, you think about the Nazis, of course the Nazis had racial purity laws. Right? They even call them racial purity laws. That's a classic example of an extremist preoccupation with racial purity. And of course there are many examples of extremism, uh, extremists who are preoccupied with ideological purity. Right? So if you perhaps don't know this, but in, in, in Cambodia in the 1970s, uh, a, a, a group called the Khmer Rouge came to power and they were utterly preoccupied with ideological purity. Right? They wanted to institute the purest, most unadulterated, undiluted form of Marxism-Leninism that had ever existed. Right? They thought that even Mao's China was a bit wishy-washy. Right? Uh, so, so that's a classic example of the purity preoccupation. And of course, this preoccupation also explains why political parties on the extreme left and the extreme right are constantly breaking up and splintering. Right? They're constantly splintering because, of course, they all want to say, we are the pure ones. Right? You think something slightly different from us, that makes you impure, so you, you get out. We're going to run, we're going we're to have our organization and you can have yours. Okay, that's the purity preoccupation. Um, another preoccupation of uh, the extremist mindset is a preoccupation with victimhood. Right? So e extremists are preoccupied with their supposed victimization by, um, uh, uh, by the other, you know, whether it's people from different races or different genders or uh, different countries. Okay, so there is a, there is a preoccupation with uh, humiliation. And a kind of classic example of this is, is, is the incel movement. Right, so incels are preoccupied with the supposed humiliation of men by women. Right. And that is part of their, that is, that is the, the incel preoccupation. Right. And it's a preoccupation with victimhood. Now, of course, you, you then face a kind of interesting question, right, which is, well, supposing you really are victims. Right. So in a certain sense, the ANC was preoccupied with, with, its, with, with being victimized, but they really were being victimized. Right? Uh, that, that was the whole point of apartheid, to victimize the African population of South Africa. Okay, but, but with incels, of course, there is no actual victimization. There is no actual humiliation. It's purely in the mind. Okay, so I think it's, we tend to think of an extremist mindset when there is preoccupation, there is a preoccupation with um, imaginary persecution. And that's uh, um, how it is with the, um, uh, with the incels. Okay, so, so that's one element of the extremist mindset. It's preoccupations. Okay, the second element of the extremist mindset is the attitudes that I take to be characteristic of extremism. Right, so extremists not only have certain characteristic preoccupations, they also have certain attitudes that mark them out as extremists in a psychological sense. Okay, so here are, here are some, uh, some uh, extremist attitudes. Okay, so one, of course, is pro-violence, and I mean pro-violence when, uh, when violence isn't necessary or justified. Right? So, 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 uh, so people on the far right today um, have this uh, pro attitude to violence, uh, even when um, uh, it's it's violence that is unnecessary uh, uh, and in an unjust cause. A second extremist attitude, of course, is hostility to compromise. Extremists don't like compromise. So if you're thinking about the question, do you have an extremist mindset? Well, what is your attitude to compromise? And I, I don't mean just mean, you know, do you think you're a compromising person? I mean, are you a compromising person? Are you prepared to make compromises? That's a second uh, uh, crucial question. Of course, extremists are also indifferent to the negative consequences of their actions. Right? So when extremists carry out terrorist acts that result in lots of civilians being killed, they're typically not bothered by that. They're just indifferent. Right? They, their attitude is shit happens. Right? That's a classic extremist attitude. Of course, extremists are intolerant. They're intolerant uh, of the religious, the ideological, or the racial other. They're anti-pluralist, and they are authoritarian. Now, there's a lot that you could say about each of these things, and I'm going to focus particularly on the issue of compromise, which is a very interesting 
a very interesting issue. So, so one thing that people very often say when the issue of compromise arises is, look, I mean, surely if you have principles, then you shouldn't be compromising. You shouldn't compromise your principles. Right? So isn't actually being uncompromising of a good thing? Isn't it something that we admire when we admire people for having strong principles? Now, I think that's far too simple, and, and I think the best, uh, the best account of this subject is given by the great Israeli philosopher Avishai Margalit, and he has a, a whole book on compromise, which I highly uh, recommend. So this is what Margalit says. He says, look, political compromises for the sake of peace are a good thing. Okay, so if you're thinking about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian dispute, his point is that that is never going to be resolved unless both sides are willing to compromise for the sake of peace, willing to give up on some of their objectives for the sake of peace. However, there are some compromises that we should not be willing to make, and these are what Margalit calls rotten compromises. Okay, so a rotten compromise is an agreement to establish or maintain an inhuman regime. So if the ANC had compromised with the apartheid state, that would have been a rotten compromise. Okay, and Margalit's point is that, is that um, we shouldn't object to compromises for the sake of peace, but we should object to rotten compromises. And I want to say that being principled, right, being principled does not require hostility to compromise per se, it only requires hostility or uh, rejection of rotten compromises. And, and this brings me to, I think, the crux of the extremist mindset. Extremism, in the psychological sense, is basically the tendency or disposition to view all compromises as rotten. Right. Extremists have no space in their way of thinking for the idea that there are some compromises that are non-rotten. Right. Because, of course, I mean, the reason they have that view is that they think that all compromise is an act of pollution. And that takes you back to the purity preoccupation. Right? So if you want to have the purest form of whatever it is that you care about, if you, and if you're preoccupied with purity, you're not going to like compromise, right? because you're going to think of compromise as a dilution of your purity. You're going to think of compromises as polluting. Okay, and here's a great quote from Margalit. Now, he doesn't talk about extremism, he talks about sectarians, but I think this is a great summing up of the position. He says, in general, the sectarian is in favor of purging and splitting for the sake of retaining the integrity of what should be kept pure. Shit is the negation of the pure, and the sectarian, indeed the extremist, craves life without shit. Right? What they fail to see what they fail to see is that compromise is part and parcel of the shitty world that we live in. Right? So, so here you see how the purity preoccupation connects with an obsession with um, pollution, and that in turn connects with hostility to compromise and a tendency to see all compromise as rotten. Okay, so, so that's an example then of, of part of what I'm calling the extremist mindset. Um, there are other aspects of the mindset which I, I won't spend any time on. I think there's also the kind of emotional dimension of the extremist mindset. So extremists tend to be angry. Right? So rage is, is very much the emotional component of the extremist mindset. I mean, when was the last time you encountered a mild-mannered extremist? Uh, um, and not just rage, but also Resentment. Right? So extremists tend to be extremely resentful um, of other, uh, of, of the other. And then there's the last element of the extremists. So so far I've talked about preoccupations, I've talked about attitudes, I've talked about emotions, and then the last element of the extremist mindset is thinking styles. Right? So extremists are uh, prone to particular forms of thinking. They're prone to apocalyptic thinking. Um, they're prone to utopian thinking and they're prone to conspiracy thinking. Okay, so these are all different elements of the extremist mindset. And if anyone wants to ask about, about these thinking styles, then 
um, uh, feel free to do so. Okay, so there you have my conception of the extremist mindset. Right? So, so you're not going to get many people who have you know, all of these dimensions, but you're certainly going to get people who have lots of them. Right? So extremism in the psychological sense is a matter of degree. Okay, so, so what would be really interesting right, is if, if, if you could sit down with Anders Breivik right, and figure out how many of these elements of the extremist mindset Breivik has, I would want to argue he probably has pretty much a full house. Right? Uh, okay, and, and so that's um, how I see the notion of a mindset. So going back to the question, is extremism something real? Are we talking about something real when we're talking about extremism? The answer now is clearly yes. Right? The answer is clearly yes, because, uh, because of course, ideologies really are, really can be located in ideological space. Right? There actually are ideologies that stand at opposite, extra, as opposite ends of a given spectrum. The use of extreme methods is a real thing. Right. The, the use of extreme methods for when, uh, you know, when, it's, when, when, when uh, they're disproportionate uh, and um, they involve unnecessary violence, that's a real thing. Right? So methods extremism is a real thing. Uh, and there really are extremist mindsets. There really are people who have an extremist mindset in the sense that I've just described. And there's some, been some research on... Uh, um, the, what is sometimes called by the psychologist the militant extremist mindset. Uh, and the research tends to support the existence of such a mindset. The psychologists understand it slightly differently from the way that I understand it. But the basic idea that extremism is a state of mind, right, that's, that, that's the idea that I want to really kind of you know, promote. Okay, so if you're thinking about yourselves, and if you are ever worrying about whether you, know, you yourselves have an extremist mindset or a tendency to extremism in the psychological sense, well, there you have your checklist. Okay, so you, have this, you can self-administer this checklist, or better still, ask someone else who knows you really well to administer the checklist and see where you come out. Okay, so... Let me now move on to the last question, which is the whole issue of what is wrong with extremism anyway? Now, of course, there are many people who have pointed out that extremism, or at least what you might think of as extremism, has actually been rather fundamental to the growth of, to the growth of our liberties. Okay, so there's a, some quotations. We owe our political liberties today to some extremists of the past. So which extremists of the past? Well, the suffragettes, for example. So the, the point is not that you know, we should call the suffragettes extremists, but certainly in their day they were thought of, a, of extremists. Okay, but we owe, I mean, women who have the vote today owe the fact that they can vote today to the suffragettes. Uh, Great quotation from Martin Luther King Jr. This is uh, his, his letter from Birmingham jail where he says, so the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. So the implication is that, well, there's good extremism and there's bad extremism. Okay, and the last, the last quotation is from a, a case that I think is of, of, of great interest. So if you think about the, um, the abolitionist movement in America, now, the people who campaigned against slavery, uh, there, was a, there was a sort of division between um, mod moderate and radical abolitionists, right? So moderate abolitionists were willing to endorse the idea of a gradual replacement of slavery, the gradual freeing of the slaves. Uh, and in the course of achieving that, they were uh, happy to accept the need for compromise with slave owners. So, so for example, compensating slave owners for the, for the loss of their slaves. On the other side were the, um, the radical abolitionists. Right? So uh, uh, William Lloyd Garrison is an example of a radical abolitionist. John Brown, another famous radical abolitionist. And they were uncompromising with the slave owners. They wanted the immediate, unconditional emancipation of the slaves with no compensation for slave owners.
okay? And they thought of themselves as fanatics. That this was a, this was a description that they used for themselves. Right? So uh, he, he, here's a here's a quotation from a, a paper by Joel Olson, the political scientist, where Olson says that the um, uh, the radical abolitionists were self-defined fanatics with an unyielding commitment to the immediate and unconditional emancipation of the enslaved. And you might then say, well, what on earth is wrong with that? I mean, surely the radical abolitionists were right. The slaves did indeed need to be emancipated immediately, without delay. And there's absolutely no reason to compensate slave owners. So if that is extremism, then isn't that just good extremism? Isn't that just the sort of thing that Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about? Okay, well, no. Um, so I, I want to say that that isn't a particularly helpful reading of the radical abolitionists, nor is it a particularly helpful reading of um, extremism in general. So for a start, the radical abolitionists did not use violence. They were basically nonviolent. They were not preoccupied with purity. Uh, they didn't have any of this weird stuff uh, that uh, is, was part of the extremist mindset. They didn't engage in apocalyptic thinking. They weren't conspiracy theorists. Um, they were against compromise with the slave owners. But on my view, of course, compromising with slave owners, that would be a rotten compromise. So the fact that the radical abolitionists were not prepared to, uh, to compromise with slave owners, that was perfectly fine. That didn't make them extremists. Right? That just meant that they um, rejected rotten compromises. So I want to suggest, okay, so here's a, here's, a, here's a kind of proposal. I want to suggest that we should think of the abolitionists not as extremists, but as radicals. Okay, and, and, and this is the sort of last point that I want to make in this lecture, that I think the distinction between extremism and radicalism is an extremely important distinction, particularly today. Right. And we shouldn't lump them all, uh, we shouldn't lump them all together. So what do I mean by radical, radicalism? And how does radicalism differ from extremism? So here's a, here's a statement that I think, in a way, encapsulates what I mean by radicalism. So this is Greta Thunberg. Everything needs to change, and it needs to change now. Now that quotation is a beautiful summing up of the two basic components of radicalism. One is a commitment to the need for fundamental change, right? So a radical is someone who believes that the status quo, that the status quo is deeply flawed and that a fundamental, as we would say, radical change to the status quo is needed. And the other element of radicalism is change has to happen now. Okay, so radicals are not gradualists, they are immediatists. They think that, as, 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 as Thunberg says, things need to change now. Furthermore, radicals do not see all compromise as rotten. Right? To be a radical, you don't need to see all compromise as rotten. You only need to see rotten compromises as rotten. Right? That's, that's another element of radicalism. If you think about the methods or the means that radicals use, right? radicals, in my sense, shy away from the use of violence. Instead, what they rely on is extra institutional but nonviolent means to advance their political agenda. So what I'm talking about are, for example, campaigns of strikes, campaigns of sit-ins, campaigns of civil disobedience. And of course, this is exactly, this really takes us back to, to Extinction Rebellion, right? because of, I mean, Extinction Rebellion on their website say, um, what we are about is uh, using non-violent but extra-institutional means of achieving our political objectives. And I think, and, and, they, and they specifically talk about civil disobedience, that, was the, that I think was the, was the real reason that they were classified as extremists. But it seems to me that we've got to make space in a democracy, we've got to make space for 
uh, ra for, for movements of radical protest that rely on uh, extra institutional means, including civil disobedience, to advance their objectives, where they are unable to advance their objectives using um, strictly legal means. Okay, and, and, and of course, it's perfectly true that, you know, in, 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 in the States, I mean, uh, if you think about um, uh, att attempts to, to fight against segregation in the States, a lot of, of anti-segregationist activity, of course, involve breaking the law. Okay, but that's fine, right? Because the law, the law, the, the law had no moral standing. Laws of segregation. Right, so, 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 so radicals then are willing to use extra institutional means in support of their objectives, but not, uh, but they don't prioritize violence. They challenge the, the master narrative. They challenge the status quo, and question assumptions that are usually unquestioned. Right. And of course, radicalism is not confined to the left. You can be, a, you can be. A, a radical of the right as well as of the left. Um, okay, so that's that's what I understand by radicalism. Now, as I've been reading out these uh, these characteristics of radicalism, I hope you can sort of hear in my voice that I don't think radicalism is a bad thing. I think radicalism is a good thing. Indeed, radicalism is an essential thing. Uh, and I mean, if I think about, I mean, I'm, I, I'm old now, right? But when I look at all you young folk out there um, and thinking about, say, the future of the planet, i.e. your futures, right. it would be absurd if we, if we classified any radical action that you might undertake in the years to come as making you an extremist. There has to be space, there has to be room for political radicalism that is not extremism. So thinking about the relationship between radicalism and extremism, I mean, there are different views that you could have about this, but the view that I like is, the, is, the, is, is, the, uh, is basically the view that although extremism and radicalism have some things in common, it's not as if they have nothing in common at all, um, there are also matters about which they fundamentally disagree. Right? So there is a genuine disagreement between extremism and radicalism. So there's disagreement about the use of violence, for example, um, there's disagreement about compromise and the legitimacy of compromise. There's disagreement about the importance of purity. Right? So on all of those areas where extremis, extremists and radicals disagree, we should come down on the side of radicalism, not on the side of extremism. Okay, so, so this, I, I think, gives me an answer to people who say, surely extremism can be a good thing. I, I think what I want to say to them is, don't say that. <laughs> Right? Because when you say that, you are, you are basically at risk of associating yourself with, as Donald Trump would say, very bad people. Right? Um, the, way you should, the way you should conceptualize your position, the way you should think about your position, as is if you're inclined in this direction at all, is as radical. Right? And, to, and, to, and to keep emphasizing the point that being a political radical does not in and of itself make you an extremist. And I think that there's a lot of terminological confusion that's been, that, that's been caused by this terrible word, radicalization. Okay, so, so those of you who know anything about the philosophy of terrorism will know that the big topic in the philosophy of terrorism is radicalization. Radicalization is defined as the process of becoming an extremist. Well, my answer to that is, hold on a second. <laughs> if it's radicalization, why don't you say that it's the process of becoming a radical? Right? And becoming a radical, becoming politically radical, becoming radicalized in that sense does not in and of itself make you an extremist. Right? So, 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 so in, in a way, this is, this is the kind of practical upshot of what I'm saying. I'm not just distinguishing between extremism and radicalism just because I'm a philosopher and philosophers like to draw distinctions. Right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm drawing a distinction here because I think this is of huge practical importance. And for you know, for the future, of, for the future of our of of, of our um, of our politics. Um, okay, uh, and and here's the last uh, the last slide. So here's the way I would sum up my own kind of position. What history teaches, what history actually teaches, is not that extremism has given us 
our our liberties and extremism has has has, has achieved all the all, all the good stuff that we like. It's radicalism, the radicalism of the abolitionists, the radicalism of the suffragettes. That has been, I think, the key to human progress. And I think that conservative critics of radicalism like to confuse it with extremism right? by using radical and extremist as in interchangeably. But I think we should resist that. We should resist that. Um, radicalization is just the process of becoming a radical. And I think there's quite a lot to be said for political radicali radicalization. Okay, so, I mean, there are forms of radicalism that are bad, and there are, so far-right radicalism, I mean, I want to argue is, is, a, is a bad form of radicalism. I think Trump is a radical in my sense, um, but I don't approve of his radicalism, but I think there are also good forms of radicalism. And ra so, so radicalism is not always, but is very often a good thing. Extremism is not. That's it. so much, uh, Kasim, um, for your extremely interesting analysis, generously giving us new perspectives on extremism as phenomenon. Now, my colleague Sebastian um, uh, Watzel, Associate Professor in Philosophy, will offer some comments uh, on the topic of the lecture, extremism. Sebastian focuses Sebastian's work focuses on the philosophy of mind, and his spe specialities are philosophical issues about attention. And he will comment um, on extremism from uh, from Germany. Uh, welcome, Sebastian. How are you in Germany? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very good. Excellent. Super, thank you for uh, the opportunity to give these comments. And I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. You might hear a baby in the background at some point. That's the explanation. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, Kazim Kassam for this fascinating lecture. And uh, I should say that I've followed um, your, your work since I was a master's student and uh, where I've read your book on self-consciousness. and. Uh, at that point, while I didn't end up agreeing with your conclusion in that book, there was so much to learn there in terms of precision and richness of argumentation. And I, uh, I have the same reaction uh, to this new work. Um, I also very much applaud how you've turned your philosophical thinking to issues of societal and political relevance. And I share the belief and ambition that philosophy can contribute something of important value to these broader debates. Like you, I think that philosophy excels by traveling between disciplines, by engaging, but also by stepping back from some empirical details and by keeping these normative questions about knowledge, about rationality and ethics always in, in clear view. Um, so I'm very happy that you gave this uh, talk today. Um, and I think it can serve as an important role model for the students of, of Xphil. Now, in the spirit of academic debate, I will focus on some points of potential contention or where I'd like to hear more to be fully convinced. My focus in these comments will be on psychological extremism. I have, as I, um, my goal is to raise some doubts about the explanatory value of this concept and also about its uh, ethical value. So, my question really, that's the heart of my question, is to question whether mindset extremism is really what we might call an interesting psychological kind. It's a psychological category made up from a variety of, of states, preoccupations, attitudes, uh, th thinking styles, and so on, as you mentioned. Uh, the question is whether that set of psychological processes and states and so on has interesting internal coherence and whether it really plays very important and interesting explanatory roles. So as an alternative, I think the alternative regarding the first thing is that maybe um, 
um, extremists share more psychologically with non-extremists than they share with other paradigm cases of extremists. And regarding the alternative reaction, the second point is the explanation of the use of extreme violence in certain circumstances may be diverse and involve more something to do with social dynamics um, that are at play both in all in these in cases, but also in the social interactions in, in other examples. Less not doesn't really uh, need mindsets for its explanation. Okay. <clears throat> so regarding the first point, I suspect there's less internal coherence to the so-called mindset extremist than maybe because because some things. Um, so to bring that out, I would like to point to a mindset that resembles in some ways the one of the extremists, but it's different in other ways. So consider a person like the French philosopher Simone Weil, whose work engaged with in some of my uh, uh, work on attention. Here I'd like to reflect on her life and mindset. Weil was intensely active in her early life in political, uh, in political activism. She engaged with Trotsky in her early 20s. She worked, she signed up to work in a factory to know what life is like from the working class. She fought in the Spanish Civil War when uh, told that she might get herself killed. They said that she had every right to sacrifice herself. Sacrifice herself. Um, she later <clears throat> became, in some ways, a kind of Catholic mystic. She has misgivings about the organized church as always, but she became, had felt an intense connection to God. Um, she died when she was only 34 years old, at least arguably caused by self-starvation. Now, I think it's easy to recognize in Simone Weil some of the character traits that are also characterized ex the extremists, like the one that describes in, in Mary, who um, plays a role in, in this American pastoral uh, uh, novel that, that you alluded to. Um, there's a mindset that's a common between her early and her late life. It's uncompromising, intense. There's disrespect for any personal consequences. Now, I'm not claiming, note, that um, Bile is an extremist. She's not. She lacks authoritarianism, anti-pluralism, and intolerance of the other. But what I suspect is that she psychologically has more in common with some paradigm extremists, like, for example, Anders Breivik, than Breivik has in common with, say, the jihadists or those that stormed the U.S. Cap capital. I think there's a certain uncompromising nature to her, like for some extremists. So this is just to, to sort of point that maybe there's not there's not that much coherence to that to this to that to those who are extremists. Now, with regard to this notion of pro-violence, one of the traits that um, Bile miss, miss, uh, misses, I also suspect that many um, of those who do commit horrific acts of violence are not, in fact, have a mindset of pro-violence. Uh, many of them say that they'd like to avoid violence, they only use it to necessary means, or as Hannah Arendt famously uh, dis described the SS officer Eichmann, they just, in a certain banal way, are doing their job. And note that the concentration camps, for example, used gas to kill because it was a known problem that those who worked on the ground in the SS didn't like the violence of killing, and therefore the gassing allowed it to happen behind closed doors. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit <clears throat> about uh, the idea that maybe mindset extremism is not an interesting psychological kind from a different angle. I'll do so by relying on the uh, work of the anthropologist Scott Atron. So Scott Atron studied the jihadist terrorists that are involved in several suicide bombings, such as the train bombing in Madrid in 2004, and he actually talked to them um, about their um, uh, mindset and about their social dynamics, and he conducted a number of psychological experiments on them, exactly to find out about the minds of those individuals, as well as their social interactions. Now, here's some ways Atron sums up his findings. He says, terrorist networks are generally no different from the ordinary kinds of network that guide people's career paths. It's a terrorist career that's remarkable not the most normal individuals who become terrorists. He also says, anthropologically and psychologically, terrorists usually are not remarkably different from the rest of the population. 
There are few crooks and some bright individuals going for violent jihad, but most terrorists fall in between. So small group dynamics can trump individual personality to produce horrific behavior in ordinary people, not only in terrorists, but also in those who fight them. What Atron finds, to go in a bit more detail, is this. The motivation and social roles of those who, for example, were involved in these suicide bombs are highly diverse. This diversity of motivations falls within the spectrum of what we would also find in other places in the population. There are some people who are bookish ideologues, some are petty criminals, just others want to just hang out with their buddies, some like the girl uh, who was the sister of someone else in the group. What tied the group together was not so much a common mindset, but that they themselves them perceived themselves as brothers in a kind of imaginary kinship. Um, and often they were actually uh, intermarried. Uh, According to Atron, it's such the powerful dynamics in such small groups in which people can feel that they can transcend themselves and they go to great lengths, including those violent terrorist acts, to defend values that they experience as bigger than themselves. Their relevant values are experienced as sacred in the sense that giving them up for some incentive is not a real option. And I think that is also something he doesn't find just in them. Most of us, for example, wouldn't give up our favorite soccer club to become... Um, uh, a fan of the uh, the, uh, the uh, opposing soccer club just because someone pays some money for it. We defend them for good and bad, and no money would uh, make a Barcelona fan say to uh, uh, support Madrid. Um, in the relevant social dynamics, the, the group of brothers comes to see it as a duty to defend those values against an outside threat, and that can lead to violent terrorism. But it's the same dynamics that also leads to mob dynamics in a soccer stadium that leads to Ukrainians to defend their country against the Russians. For Atron, there's nothing special in the minds of those who commit terrorist acts. They don't have a special mindset. They have the same human minds we all have, ready to fight for our values when we see them threatened. They have the same essentialist tendencies that divide us, that, tend, that we use to divide the world between us and them. And they have the same readiness to be influenced by peer pressure. So if Atron is right to think, then there isn't any special extremist mindset. It's the same social dynamics, the same tendencies for valuation, the same thinking styles that we all have when they're put in a special context. Now, is that context special? Arguably, that context also isn't special. Uh, Atron thinks that warlike contracts of group aggression were common in human evolution in our cultural history. And here's some uh, other books that make a similar point. Uh, so arguably, the context that leads young men to engage in violent actions against outgroup members is not extreme in the course of human history. No, this is not to relativize a justified violent act. We need to foster environments where our minds and social dynamics do not lead to violence. We need to think about creating a social context where our tendency to hold certain values sacred and our tendency to identify with social groups is a force for good and not bad. But in my view, it's important that we realize that these forces are the same whether they lead to good or bad. Okay, we'll end with this. <clears throat> now, given what I said about the question about the questionable explanatory value of talk of extremist mindsets, uh, I want to end by thinking about is it is it ethically useful to use that term? Now, extremism describes something that is often perceived as politically and ethically neutral. You can be left or right, is Christian or Islamist uh, in an extremism. It's for this reason that it's a conceptual tool that's often used by everyone against their opponents. Now, the danger here is that against your arguments, uh, um, that um, it will be used just as a, a means to brand the actions of the opponents. It's like Fox News just said that um, we should accept Italian, the new Italian fascism as in the middle of the political spectrum, because after all, it's not extreme if most people accept it. So since it's also doubtful that it really explains the actions of extremists, I'm, I'm somewhat doubtful that we should use that terminology. It's a dangerous conceptual tool whose explanatory value is somewhat limited. Okay, so this is the last thing. Um, now, we can, in philosophy like you do, develop, analyze these conceptual tools that we find, like the word extremism. But maybe we should, what we should do instead is develop new conceptual tools, the best tools that we can develop to actually fight the terrible acts that we find. And we can talk about some ideas I have, tools that may be useful for that. Thank you.
thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. This was uh, really interesting. Uh, I'm honored and really glad to welcome Associate Professor in Social Anthropology, Katrine Tolefson, to give her uh, comments on extremism. Tolefson has conducted extensive ethnographic fieldwork amongst supporters of far-right parties and movements in Europe uh, uh, and in the Middle East. The past decade, she has been researching and writing on far-right mobilization and belonging, and more recently on cyber-fascism. In addition to her academic pursuits, Tolefson is, amongst others, the head of the Norwegian government's Commission on Extremism. So please welcome Katrina Tolefson. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to provide my comments to your book on extremism. It's a great honor for me to be here today. And reading your book, uh, Kasim Kasam, I appreciate how you approach extremism as a multifaceted phenomenon that needs to be understood in context, and that requires the combined efforts not only of philosophy, but of sociologists, of historians, it, it, it creates to have this holistic understanding. There are indeed diverse drivers and pathways into participation in extremist movements. And in your book, you identify three forms of extremism. So method, ideology, and mindset. And today I will suggest a thought I believe that is lacking and is key to successful preventative strategies. And that is extremism as embodied practice. Extremism is not only in the mind, it's also in the joy of participation. My comments and critique today are informed by my discipline anthropology in a subfield called the anthropology of extremism. Knowledge about the drivers and attraction of present-day purity-seeking dehumanization requires the encounter with lived and embodied experience. Now, the past two decades, I have been researching far-right parties and movements, both the radical right and the extreme right. And I have spent in total several years with people whom politics I disagree with in countries such as both Hungary, England, Israel, more recently in cyberspace. And the people I got to know were indeed multifaceted humans, far beyond one-dimensional media depictions of angry white men, or lone wolves, some were even mild-mannered. They did not certainly judge their own acts or practices as wrong or evil. In their view, they were do-gooders, merely protecting the purity of the nation and restating a racial or religious order of things. Now, through this grounded approach of anthropology, by looking at fascism at ice level, one can understand the attractions and this knowledge generated from fieldwork and all the anthropological fieldworks inform my comments and critique today. So my first critique follows on um, Sebastian Walter's comments on extremism as a psychological mindset that is devoted the most attention in the book. I believe that this approach, basing primarily on the mindset, is problematic to the study of extremist movements. Moreover, it can also undermine certain efforts to design effective preventative strategies, and I will explain why. Because extremism is not only a way of thinking, it's also ways of experiencing and ways of feeling. It is in the joy of participation, from the sensations at political rallies and ritual performance, to fascism-rendered aesthetic. To extremists that nurture belonging, and mainstream fascism in the intimate sphere of everyday life, to extremism commodified through clothing and white power music. Extremism is not only the spectacular violence and rigid minds, it's jihadi groups weeping to nasheeds, it's white supremacists that creatively produce and spread mocking memes and gamified violence. In the age of social media, new forms of extremism have emerged that orchid straits with the aid of boots and trolls. Yes, yes, ways of thinking, but also new ways of experiencing and of structuring feelings. And also, in Thomas Hegemer's work, he shows how the role of how, how jihadists cry. So by this time, the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Sarwaki, was killed in the US drone strike in 2006. 
he had become a symbol of the ruthless brutality of jihadi groups. Yet he was not only known as the slaughter al-Dab, methodist extremism, he was also known as al-Baq, the weeper. According to a cellmate, he cried constantly. He was very emotional, like a child. So it can be the sensory, the sensual, the effectual, in ritualized behaviors that draws individuals to extremist movements. A psychological approach to extremism can miss out of the most important drivers and explanation for why it appears beautiful and righteous to some people and why extremist is sacralized and worth crying and dying for. You also have a section in the book about doubt. You note how extremists are fervent believers and believe uncompromisingly. Yet there are numerous studies that show how extremists are full of doubt and contradictions. Indeed, in my recent studies, I have interviewed several young users of, of 4chan, a digital subculture. And throughout the so-called radicalization processes, they have grown up in a screed-mediated, hyper-connected age, and they express a great deal of both existential pain, uncertainty throughout the radicalization process, and even doubt and vanity in the moment of live-streaming violence attacks. They are not ideologically committed entrepreneurs, they are drifters that can easily change, and clearly this has implications for countering and preventing violent extremism. People can be drawn to purity projects for a variety of reasons, like affirmation of belonging, masculinity, personal loyalties. And Katie Blee from a groundbreaking study back in 1996, she shows how women of the Ku Klux Klan, they construct a self-understanding that both fit the agendas of the extremist movement and how they challenge other elements to fit their own beliefs and life experiences. And these women are quite pragmatic. They do not believe uncompromisingly. They do not favour gender inequality, oppose abortion, or favour the death penalty for homosexuality. The women work to create a rational connection between themselves and the goals of extremist politics. So anthropological studies show how there is a facade of political unity and ideological coherence, yet backstage there is contestation, there is doubt. And this finding also has implications. If the condition for participation is social and rational, rather than psychological, a shared mindset or even ideology, well-designed PCV strategies with a gendered approach can counter recruitment into these groups. My second critique is on extremism as ideology. The findings of recent research on terrorism and ideology highlight that right-wing extremists or also known in the US now as racially and, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists to bypass the right-wing spectrum. They are often less interested in ideological specificities than they are in the wider culture and behaviors of the milieus in which they seek to embed themselves. Much of the post-organizational extremism online is highly fluid. It lacks a clear organizational center and also clear ideological cohesion. And this is not to suggest that ideology, ideology plays no role in the right-wing extremist online spaces. And some right-wing extremists I have interviewed were attracted to the digital subculture for particular effective experiences afforded by the sites. And transgressing posting practices and meme making alongside other uses as role play and idealized version of themselves, and that's an equally important driver. Personal allegiances are as important as ideological commitment to many extremists, and this is true for the female neo-Nazis Katie Blee mentioned, true for the young men I interviewed in the white supremacy digital subculture. And it's not necessarily in the mind and not always coherent ideologies. And then, of course, this again has implications. In the book, you suggest that effective counter-radicalization requires serious engagement with arguments and compelling counter-narratives. However, evidence suggests that counter-narratives might be more promising in countering hate speech than in countering violent extremism. Indeed, online community-making cannot be approached as this fixed static text. 
Uh, studies have shown that those participating in these spaces are less likely than, for instance, jihadi Islamists to engage with counter-narrative initiatives. Again, it's not in the mind, it's in the body. So most importantly, I think this narrative, counter-narrative approach is an insufficient piece of strategies towards extremist milieus, where behaviours and the joy of communal participation is equally and at time even more important than ideas and ideology. So I look forward to your questions and conversation. Thank you. Yes, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Katrina, and thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I want to ask Kasim, do would you like to um, to say some words before we open up for the yeah, yeah. audience? Yes. yes, thank you. Yes. Well, f first of all, uh, thanks for those two very uh, illuminating and challenging sets of uh, sets of comments. Um, I don't want to go on for too long, so I'll just say a couple of a couple of brief things. Um, so in terms of uh, the question about social dynamics uh, that Sebastian raised, and in a way this also ca came up with, with, with Catherine's comments, that, that of course I think it's perfectly true that if you're asking the question, why do I individuals jo join, participate in what you might think of as extremist communities or extremist organizations, so if you're thinking about, the, as it were, the foot soldiers rather than the leaders, um, it, it, I think it's perfectly true that there are a whole range of different factors that, that uh, encourage people to join up. Social factors, personal factors, friendships. Uh, there was the famous book by Mark Sageman where he talks about you know, terrorists as being just a bunch of guys, you know, uh, f friends who sign up together for, organized, for terrorist organizations just because they're friends. Right, so I think that's all true, and, I, and I, I, the, the conclusion I would draw from that is the following, right, that, that it, it, in, in many of these cases, these individuals, the foot soldiers, are in fact not extremists, in my sense. Right? They, they may not have the preoccupations um, of uh, the extremist mindset. Uh, they may not be ideological extremists. I mean, their knowledge of um, their, their, their ideological knowledge may be very, very limited. Um, so they are drawn to these organisations for what you might think of as sort of social, social dynamic reasons, and they might be used by the leadership of, of these organisations to you know to do things like storming you know storming the capital. But I think what that goes to show is that not every not every foot soldier, not every person who's involved in extremist act what you might think of as extremist activities is necessarily an extremist. People get sucked into these things for all sorts of reasons and in all sorts of ways. But if you think in terms of the, le as, you know, the leadership, the driving force of these organizations, I mean, take, take, take Al-Qaeda. So, uh, I, I mean, when uh, Bin Laden was killed, they found lots of documentation in his study and a, a, a book being published recently called the Bin Laden Papers. Uh, and of course, when you read that, I think you can find much greater evidence of uh, these mindset features that, that I'm talking about. Or if you think about uh, uh, Bin Laden's deputies, uh, Zawahiri, again, I think you can find lots of these, uh, lo lots of these preoccupations and attitudes which I was, which I was talking about. So, uh, so that's the first thing I'd want to say, that of course, when it comes to participation in, uh, it, you know, in, in, in events like the storming of the capital, we, need, we of course need to accept that not everyone who participates has an extremist mindset, not everyone who participates is an, is an ideological extremist. They might not even be uh, methods extremists in the sense that they might not have a, a theoretical commitment to the use of violence, right? It's just that they get sucked into what eventually becomes a violent, a violent event. Right? So, so, I mean, one way of putting this would be to say that, you know, extremism in a sense is, is a much rarer thing than in its pure form is a much rarer thing than, than, than you might think. I mean, there are lots of people in, you know, doing all sorts of stuff which l results in them being labeled extremists, but it's actually, the, it's actually sort of higher up the food chain that talk of extremism in, in, in the senses that I was talking about becomes kind of much more appropriate. I think this also bears on the question of the relationship between extremism and terrorism. I, th I think Catherine was absolutely right that a lot of people who, who carry out terrorist acts, 
Um, uh, you know, I mean, are they extremists? Are they, are, are, they, are they ideological extremists? I mean, I'd be willing to take a bet that quite a few of the, you know, young men who were suicide bombers in Iraq, you know, you know there would maybe all sorts of reasons for they, them engaging in suicide terrorism, which may have very little to do with ideology, you know, or even mindsets. I mean, the whole issue of suicide terrorism is a very interesting issue. But again, if you look at the, if you look at the, the people who were um, um, organizing these campaigns, who were c c controlling the violence and ordering the violence, I think they fall into uh, they fall into a different category. So not everybody who carries out an act of terrorism is an extremist, in in my sense. Right. So uh, I, I, I think this is a kind of more general point that I want to get at. That that in, in answer to Sebastian, I, I mean, I think he's absolutely right that there is a question about the internal coherence of the notion of an extremist mindset. You know, there is a question about, well, how much does this, how much does this explain? Yet the fact of the matter is that when you actually look at the agendas of extremists of the left, of the right, Islamist extremists and others, you know, as Hoffa noted back in the 1950s, it's very hard to ignore the commonalities there. There, there do seem to be certain common features that are that are, you know, that are visible, these preoccupations that I was talking about, for, for, for example. Uh, so so uh, it, what I'm trying to do justice to is, is as it were, what, what seems apparent from the, from the pronouncements and actions of um, what you might think of the leadership level uh, of, these, um, of these organizations and, and groups. But of course, I don't think that having an extremist mindset is an all or nothing matter. I think it's a, mat it's a matter of degree. And a number of the examples that both responses, respondents produced of people who commit acts of violence or are involved in acts of, acts of terrorism or you know, storming of the capital, you know, the examples where these people don't seem to have the elements of the extremist mindset, that's fine. By, by, by my lights, that's absolutely fine. So, so I'm not in the business of, 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 of convicting everybody who participates in these sorts of activities as an extremist in, um, uh, in, in, any, of my, in any of my senses. Um, it's a matter of it's a matter of degree. Um, I think it's uh, true that terrorists are in some ways no different from the rest of us, but I think terrorists who really are no different from the rest of us are not are not extremists in the mindset sense. Right? There are other reasons they've been they've been drawn into uh, violent activity for, for 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 other reasons. Just to end with uh, the, the 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 point. I mean, I very much like this idea of of. Um, um, embodied practice and uh, ways of thinking, experiencing, and feeling. I think that's extremely, I think that's extremely, imp uh, extremely Im Im important insight. Uh, and and I mean, you know, there are all sorts of connections. If you think about, um, if you football hooliganism, which was a big thing forty or fifty years ago, where you know football fans used to fight each other um, for the honour of their team. You know, lots of the studies of football hooligans came up with very similar insights to this, uh, that they fought because, you know, being part of a, being part of a, a, a group of embodied agents going out and, and, you know, and battling their opponents was indeed a way, of, a way of feeling, a way of experiencing the world that was tremendously seductive. Uh, and of course that, you know, they weren't ideologically motivated. Uh, uh, but ne you know, so, so I think there th there is that, and I think that is something that also has relevance to uh, uh, people signing up for extremist organisations. Nevertheless, I'd want to insist that uh, if you're thinking about um, the ideologies of the far left, the far right, uh, Islamist ideologies, there are certain common themes and certain common patterns. And what what I think it's, it's important to do is to try and see what these things have in common. It turns out that they have actually quite a lot in common. Right. Yes, thank you so much. I, I see that we now have, uh, we have nine minutes left. So please, <laughs> if you can join the panel with um, Kasim and Sebastian. Sebastian, now you are in the panel <laughs> up there. And I think we'll open up for questions for, Ka for Kasim. Uh, and I think the first one is uh, in the front. Um, we'll have a microphone, and please introduce yourself very shortly. Uh, thank you very much. It is uh, very interesting. Uh, my name is Farida Ahmadi. I'm a social anthropologist, and I was born and grew and was in the jail three times in Afghanistan. 
and uh, I would I try to understand your speech and can you please tell me Taliban had a meeting in Norway uh, is this meeting it was a rotten compromise and what in which kind this is terrorist this is human being this is radical what is it? so wh which meeting are you talking about they had a meeting with i didn't catch the last yeah the meeting the taliban yes. after taliban take uh, power in afghanistan yeah in the private uh, flight uh, airplane come to norway uh. to talk and the establish in oslo and all western country come here and talk with them and make and in some year, it was very interesting because Afghan woman was participated. It was a voice there. I'm. Uh, it is. It is nice to to woman Afghan woman be represented. But I like to know uh, to understand your definition, mm -hmm. philosophical definition to philosophy help us to understand reality. And uh, please tell who is Taliban and your definition. Right, so, so the, the, way, the way I defined it was that a rotten compromise is a compromise to preserve a regime of uh, inhumanity, cruelty, or injustice, something, something along those lines. That would, be a that would be a rotten compromise. So in the case of a, a meeting between the Taliban and, say, someone in Norway, the, the question is, who is it that's making it? Is there a rotten compromise here at all? And if so, who's making the rotten compromise? So if you're looking, at, I mean, so a lot then depends on, on what your view of the Taliban actually is. Right? So if you think that the Taliban regime is cruel, inhuman, and unjust, if that's what you really think, then, then it, it will then follow that a compromise with the Taliban would then be a rotten compromise. I mean, the, the, the complication here, I think, is that, is that it, well, what if it turns out that the Taliban represent the majority of, of Afghans? If that turns out to be the case, then you might say, well, you know, we, we would rather not deal with them, but we have to. Right? And that, that would, but that would, be, that would be a case in which considerations of realpolitik are actually driving the kind of engagement that the West has with this with this regime. I mean, I, uh, my own view would be that yes, in an ideal world, one wouldn't want to one wouldn't want to compromise with them, because from my perspective, they're just so awful, right? So that would be that would be my view. But of course, we live in a world of realpolitik, and in which, of course, you know, governments and states and diplomats have to have to engage with people that they would rather not engage with. Well, we also have a question. If you don't want to add something, Catherine, I don't know. We have a question up on the sixth row. So it's about uh, how do you understand when it's appropriate to use the word extremism to label something? Is it is it supposed to be objective or uh, culturally relative or um, maybe even uh, subjective? Um, and the, the reason why I, uh, why I was thinking about that was this point about on method extremism, about when something is uh, just or unjust, mm. who gets to decide that if it's objective? Thank you. Yeah, so, so that, that, that's an extremely good and difficult question, right? So, so I mean, of course, the, the definition of uh, methods extremism is normative, that's how I would put it. So, it, so, so there's, a, there's a normative evaluative element in the definition. Now, the minute you have notions like just cause in the definition, you are then going to, of course, confront the question, well, just by whose lights, right? Um, and, and the only, and of course, you, I mean, the only way you can ever approach that is just by your lights, just by the lights of the person who's making the assessment. And of course, that is why there are arguments about this. You know, that is why, you know, I might, I might re regard the, the, the system of social arrangements in Afghanistan as unjust, uh, and no doubt the Taliban regard it as just. So then you have the sort of meta-philosophical question of, well, okay, so is there a right, is there a right or wrong answer, right? Uh, and, and, and my own view is that there actually is a right, or there, there is a right and, and wrong answer in these in these cases. Uh, and the, I mean, just to say very briefly, 
I mean, w what I would say is that, is, that, is that there are certain conditions of human flourishing that are, uh, that are being violated by the Taliban, right? So whatever they say about the justice of their system of social arrangements, right, the fact that they treat women the way they treat women, that is in fact unjust, right? So, so uh, and that's, that's my view, right? That's an argument that, I, that I'd want to defend. Uh, so is it is it subjective? Well, it's my view, right? And I'd hope to persuade you that it's the that it's the right view, uh, and, and I think there is a you know there is a fact of the matter. Not just, uh, in, the, in the discipline of social anthropology, there is a tradition for on the culture relativity of understanding a phenomenon in the world. So I have a colleague, Benjamin Teitelbaum, for instance, who calls for an immoral anthropology of the far right. He says when you work with people whom you might disagree yourself as a researcher with their politics, you might find it morally repulsive, you're still obliged to empathetically listen and even to advocate for their agency. And he has ended up also editing novels by one of his neo-Nazi informants in Sweden. And I critique that approach because I find it morally unsustainable in an article I call towards a moral anthropology of the far right, that would be the sub discipline of anthropology with the anthropology of extremism, which necessarily has very normative underpinnings, like in political science, where you deem a certain practice uh, or attitude as extremist, whether you rely on the behavioral defini definition or the attitudinal definition. So I think it's, uh, you know, it, it has strong normative foundation. It, it, it depends on your positionality and, and yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question all the back and then two uh, more questions after this one. Yes, I was wondering, uh, as uh, extremist group uh, tend to reach their goals, they tend to be less extreme. Uh, I would say like uh, um, uh, w when there's another group which is more extreme, the, the, the controlling group, the power group tends to become less extreme and uh, Western or more legitimate uh, nations tend to work more with this group. Um, how would you would you then still say they are extreme, or how would you categorize uh, this process? Well, I, I think what ex I, I mean in the rare examples of extremist groups that achieve their objectives, uh, if their objectives include running a country, what they very quickly discover is how hard that is. Um, so, it, I mean, it's, it's one thing for the Taliban to be f fighting against the Americans and getting the Americans out, but it's a completely different ball game when they actually have to start running the country themselves. And they find, you know, they have found and will find themselves having to make compromises of various sorts. And this is, of course, a source of great friction uh, a, 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 among, the, a, among the Taliban leadership. Uh, does this mean that they are less, less extreme? Uh, you know, as a, you know, as a result of as a result of this, well, I mean, in a in a in a kind of superficial sense, yes, because they you know they obviously do now have to make compromises that they wouldn't have otherwise have made. But but I'd want to say that they're not ex they're not less extreme in their hearts, right? It's just that they it's just that they are confronting certain practical difficulties that they just have to deal with now. You can also see the strategic polishing of the surface and mainstreaming of both content and policies by extremist actors in order to obtain power. And if one have a narrower definition of extremism, I know you focus on violence, but if one also define extremism as the opposition to universal human rights and, and uh, in certain autocratic states, we see how you know, that is a slow and quite slowly process when democracy dies. It's not necessarily through violence, it's through a very, you know, Drip, drip process. So, thank you. Mm. Uh, can I say something about this? So I, I think this is actually a very good question because I also suspect that when uh, an ideology that is extremist gets, gains power in a country, then the kinds of mindset one was going to find are going to be quite different from those one finds when it's fighting for power. Uh, so I think that the one's going to, that, that's I think an important, there are going to be changes. I mean, you need bureaucrats and so on. And, one sees that, of course, I mean, famously in the Nazi in Germany, where the, the mindsets of those ideologues might be far and few between. They were just executioners. Uh, so I think that's an, it's important that, to see that one's going to find differences. Uh, I'm Saber. Uh, I'm from the uh, Department of Literature. Uh, you partly addressed uh, the question of definition. I had a similar kind of question, but 
a kind of example I want to quote. I think this is uh, the problem of discourse that how uh, this extremism is uh, addressed in discourse and how it is disseminated through media. Uh, so uh, when we uh, go back into the history, when Russians invaded Afghanistan, the same Taliban were uh, freedom fighters for America. They were divine fighters. But after 10 years, the same people became the terrorists. So this is a kind of prime example how discourse changed uh, the definition. So I think uh, I'm pretty sure if uh, uh, Ukraine had a problem with United States of America, Zelensky would be the most wanted person in the world, I think. And secondly, for the interest, how the interest serves that one. Uh, Hillary Clinton once acknowledged that the United States invested in radicalizing a sect, a new brand of Islam. And later on in Libya, we saw that the ISIS, ISIS fought along with NATO. So the, there, there were alliances. So how this interest and how this discourse shapes this terrorism? Thank you. Well, I, 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 I completely agree with what you're saying, right? That, that, you know, we, that, that in, in the world of realpolitik, all sorts of alliances are formed that, that, that subsequently you, uh, are broken and former allies become enemies. I mean, the, the, case, of, the case of the American reliance on uh, the so-called mujahideen to get the Russians out of Afghanistan, I think that's a very, very interesting case because there you had the U.S. relying on relying on groups that they should not have, should not have relied on right, uh, uh, for very good reasons, because of what these people actually believed and what they actually wanted. Uh, and, and, and the Americans found to their cost that once the Russians, Russians were, were out, these groups then started to fight against them. And I think the lesson of this is, is actually to be very ca careful about the principle of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right, the enemy of the enemy of my enemy might also be my enemy, right? and that's exactly what the Americans should. They never learn, right? They they always end up allying themselves with, you know, with with highly disreputable uh, forces and organizations in pursuit of their short-term priorities, like allying with the Northern Alliance to get rid of the Taliban. Why did they do that? Right? I mean, that was the origin of the po of the policy disaster that that eventually resulted in them being being evicted from Afghanistan. So, so they should take on board the, the thing that you're saying. Right? Uh, uh, and, and that would, uh, I mean, of course, that would address your point about the, the way that discourse is driving policy rather than the other way around. Thank you so much. We have to keep on the discussion for later. And uh, Sebastian, I'm sorry you didn't have those, uh, the possibility to be in Oslo, but we also want to thank you very much. Maybe you can see the flowers <laughs> that you should have had. <laughs> and we want to thank um, Kasim very much. Oh, well, thank you so thank you. much <laughs> for Thanks your great thank lecture. You. And also Katrina. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much and good luck with your work. Thank you. We'll see you <laughs> and we'll keep on the discussion and like, later on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for all attending.